Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our fourth virtual talk. I have the great pleasure of introducing not just an author, but a hero as well. <coughs> Excuse me. For tonight's speaker attends to COVID victims in hospital. In fact, if I'm not very mistaken, he has done so today before this talk, and certainly had done so yesterday before he met some of us in the library committee for a short session. Amongst his other interests uh, is natural history. Did you know that the caves of Elora were hewn from rock formed in the greatest lava floods that the world has known? Eruptions, eruptions so enormous that they may well have obliterated <coughs> excuse me, dinosaurs. Or that Bengaluru owes its unique climate to a tectonic, to a tectonic event that took place 88 million years ago. That the Ganga and the Brahmaputra sequester nearly 20% of global carbon and their sediments over millions of years have etched submarine can canyons in the Bay of Bengal that are larger than the Grand Canyon. Ever heard of the Rajasaurus, an Indian dinosaur that was perhaps more ferocious than T-Rex? Many such amazing facts and discoveries from 70 million year old crocodile eggs in Mumbai to the nesting grounds of dinosaurs near Ahmedabad are a part of his many awards winning book Indica, a deep natural history of the Indian subcontinent. Let me now hand you over to Pranay Lal, who will take you through a compelling narrative of India's deep natural history filled with fierce reptiles, fantastic dinosaurs, amazing plants, and much else. You will remain muted during the talk, as I'm sure all of you know by now, and you'll get a chance to ask questions after Pranay's talk. Over to you, Pranay. Thank you, Sarajesh. Uh, Am I audible? Is this good? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Fine. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I have the, you know, the uh, compelling task of uh, sharing a four and a half billion year history of the earth in less than 45 minutes, I guess. So I think uh, without uh, much ado, uh, I'm just going to uh, take a quick shot at trying to be as uh, honest and as uh, comprehensive as I can in, 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 in those 45 minutes. So I am a biochemist by training. I love to see nature with, in, from a different perspective. I think uh, tectonics, climate, paleoclimate has a huge impact on how we live today. And I, un I believe that a deep understanding of natural history is something which is very important as we create complex problems for our children for the future. I wrote a book which took me 22 years to write, and it's a natural history account of the Indian subcontinent, starting from the oldest rocks in India to the youngest sediments of the Ganga that are washed every year uh, after after the monsoon. So this is what the, compre uh, the, the comprehension of the book is, that I try covering the, the entire swathe of time and the landmass, the entire Indian subcontinent from Myanmar to uh, Gwadar in uh, Pakistan to Altai Shan and to, uh, to the tip of uh, Sri Lanka. So that's the spread of the book. I'm not going to sell you hard sell the book because it's freely available on the net. So if you don't feel like going out and buying it, it's available as a PDF. But I urge you to buy this book because it's the paper quality, the print, and the pleasure of reading comes from a hard copy. So let's start from the very beginning. About 4.5 billion years ago, uh, two protoplanets collided with each other. One was a mass-sized uh, small protoplanet, which is called Thea. And the earliest uh, uh, congregation of gases and silica, silica uh, which, which was a, called the proto-Earth, uh, collided. And this was a time when the orbits uh, of the planets uh, was not very fixed. And some of the truant uh, planets kept colliding with one another. So our Earth was actually the uh, creation of something that happened 4.5 billion years ago uh, of, uh, from the collision of these two uh, uh, protoplanets. And what happened from this was that the swirl of the, the collision, the, the thing that it created, a cocktail of chemicals, is the thing that created uh, the Earth and the Moon. And uh, this is a, a historic moment uh, for our planet because it actually gives that 22 and a, and a half degrees tilt to our uh, the inclination that you heard uh, 
your geography teacher telling you when you were young, uh, uh, 20, uh, you know, uh, 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 took about 20 million years for it to find that bobble and getting it just right to become 20 uh, to uh, and a half degrees in, in, in its uh, inclination. Now this is very critical because you know we rotate at, at that angle and it lends that uh, speed and the wobble to the rotation of the earth and gives us a distinct climate. Um, let's move a little further that you know about a, for a billion years from four and a half billion years to about three billion years the earth was pummeled with, by meteorites and asteroids that were coming from all around. Remember this is a very chaotic time in our solar system. And most of the planets are yet to find a lot of their uh, orbits and they're just only settling in. The Earth and the Moon are much closer and the Moon takes a lot of hits from meteorites. That, that's the reason why the meteors, the, the pockmarks that you see on the Moon are actually the, the misgivings of meteorites that actually collided with them. And, but this is the time when all the water is created on Earth. Much of the water that came to the Earth came from meteorites. And collisions like these were very common happening all over the surface of the earth. Very few of these remain. And, and what was happening at this time was there were lots of uh, rocks that were being coked and recoked because the heat that was being generated both from the young earth's own core as well as the meteor themselves were creating new rocks all the time. Now this is a rock that is not far from where I live. It's in Delhi. It's a very beautiful rock. It's been cut for the road, but and I don't think uh, you know it's going, many people are going to appreciate this. Uh, but look at this rock carefully, and you see in the center this black mass, which actually has the highest concentration, the metals with the highest densities that stay at the center. Now imagine this to be like a bit like a filter paper. Uh, you remember the time when we were playing truant in the chemistry lab, you know, have played, got a filter paper, we put some dyes at the center and let, let uh, a drop of alcohol fa fall in the center or water and the water would diffuse outside carrying with it the dyes or the reagents, right? And this is exactly what happened in geological terms. You can see the lighter elements moving outside the center, the core has the heavier elements. And that's precisely what all rocks do. They are beautiful to look at. The only thing is we need the gaze and the patience to look at them. I'm just going to go another billion years and you know the first and the oldest rocks of India begin, began to form about 3.3 billion years ago. This is the time when Earth started to become stable. The first rocks started to pop up. And you know the, one of the oldest uh, regions of the, of the uh, Indian subcontinent is around where Bangalore is. And this, this is one of those rocks. Some of the rocks that exist here are uh, about 3.3, 3.2 billion years old. And this is also the time as the rocks were stabilizing, the first cells, the first cells that gave, uh, came to life began to emerge at this time. This is a very popular rock. I, I just wanted to show this to you because it's po popular in Indian culture. This is called Sambha's rock. This is, uh, this is the rock uh, on which the film Shole actually uh, got its, uh, you know, the, the mood of the film was set around this uh, rock. And it's called Samba after the henchman of Gabbar Singh. For those of you who haven't watched it, I'm sorry, uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a classic. Uh, and this is a rock which is now about uh, uh, 110 kilometers uh, northwest of Bangalore in a place called Ramnagaram. Uh, you know, this is one of the better preserved sites of Ramnagaram. The rest of them have been quarried. For example, the place where uh, the village was uh, made, uh, for the film Shole is now decimated and there's now an expressway there. Uh, 2.5 billion years ago was also a very historic time because like I was telling you, there were these massive meteors colliding with the earth. There are very few examples of meteors colliding and you know, we know that they create craters like the lunar crater that exists in Maharashtra. But when the, the crust was still being formed, the, the, the region below the crust the place which was still soft with lava and magma still roiling in, uh, the magma was hot enough to pour out. So when this uh, particular uh, meteorite collided, this is a site near Gwalior, a place called Shivpuri. This is about uh, eight and a half square kilometers in, uh, in, in its area. It looks like a tiger paw and it's from space. This image is taken from you know high in space. So imagine this to be a 
big plateau like structure and it stands out of nowhere the rest of the the surface of the land the landscape is perfectly flat and then you see this structure this uh, this geological feature emerging out of nowhere and that's what is amazing about this 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 beautiful uh, uh, you know geological feature it's a purple color mountain look at it it's so different from the rest of the the structure that you see the rest of the landscape and instead of like i said instead of getting depressed into the earth instead of creating a cavity or a hole on the earth this actually got raised up so this is one of the three craters in the world there's one in the antarctica region there's one in russia and there's one in india and this did not get discovered till about 2012 and we didn't even know about it it's still not protected you can go and quarry and do whatever you want it's but it's it's a it's a majestic it's a it's a it's a glorious piece of geological history this is the other famous uh, meteorite but this is much younger this is something that our ancestors when they had left africa and had reached india would have seen this this is about 52000 years ago that this meteorite fell this is the lonar crater this is now blue in color but as as you know that this is currently uh, because of uh, phytoplanktons and zooplanktons it's pink in color right so uh, the the previous uh, crater that i showed you actually the meteorite site is not a depression but something that has got raised several uh, hundred feet above uh i want to show you this because uh, i don't want you to admire the reclining vishnu this is from the bandargarh national park i want you to focus on that green slimy thing that vishnu is looking at you know as he is looking uh, with his shankha and his chakra uh, you know what he's looking at is actually peering at that green slimy thing uh, in the pond that is next to him and you know i think that that reflective mood of vishnu actually says that you know till phytoplanktons and cyanobacter and the algae that grows on top of water we have hope because it's all these humble creatures that that exist on stagnated water all over our country do we get all our oxygen today the free oxygen in the world that exists today is because of these phytoplankton it's not the trees so i have been very critical and i have been criticized for that matter when i say this in talks that trees are in some sense selfish because they don't produce all the oxygen for you and me it's actually for themselves they capture the carbon the next morning they are trying to capture the oxygen right so although the respiratory process is continuous the carbon fixing happens in the morning but oxygen uh, sucking by trees intensifies during the night but you know the humble creatures that i'm talking about the cyanobacteria are doing this on a continuous basis and that's what makes them the best carbon fixing organisms and also the most prolific oxygen producers so don't bet on trees yet it is saving our ponds and saving our rivers and lakes and the oceans the open oceans on which they are found that consume all the oxygen uh, sorry all the ca carbon that we are emitting in excess but also producing the free oxygen that we get so about uh, 3.2 billion years ago there was a creature that uh, came together an uh, ancestor of these uh, blue green algae and cyanobacteria that came together to form colonies like this one it's called a stromatolite they look like cabbage like structures but they come in fascinating forms uh, what stromatolite did was that along the margins of lands and shallow seas they began to colonize before them the creatures that were living and and proliferating were, were organisms that were feeding on carbon dioxide hydrogen sulfide and methane and they did not produce much oxygen but the first oxygen breathing creatures the blue green algae and the phytoplankton were the ones that actually started to displace those creatures that were consuming methane and hydrogen sulfide now my point being here is that it took about a half a billion years for these creatures till about 2.5 billion years they they struggled and uh, elbowed out these uh, other anaerobic orga organisms the organisms that do not breathe out uh, oxygen right they consume other uh, elements like uh, like i said carbon dioxide methane hydrogen sulfide and they have very little role for oxygen production or consumption now this humble creature is the one that started to produce so much oxygen that it caused the freezing of the earth about 2.5 billion years ago and we have examples of this in india and this happened in several successions 
there was one freezing that happened about 750 million years ago. Now I'm going to jump, take a big, uh, massive jump. I just want to show you some rocks that happened that that were created at that time. Now this is a, a rock. This is uh, like I said that the freezing of the Earth, the, with so much oxygen being produced by stromatolite, caused the Earth to freeze. And when volcanic activity began to uh, unfreeze the Earth, there were glaciers that were created that started to move towards the unfrozen part, the shallow seas. And this is something that you get to see if you go to the uh, glacial fields in Himalayas or Canada or other parts of the world. But remember that this is about 750 million year old rock. And if you can look at those lines, those are sedimentary rocks, layer upon layer of soil that has been deposited in which rocks have been, have been dropped. Now, as you know, as, as a glacier, glacial, uh, uh, glacier travels at a very slow pace, it gathers these rocks and makes them into a rounded uh, patch of rocks and then deposits it in a, in a shallow sea. This is exactly what happened at the shallow sea. It de de deposited all these shallow rocks in sediments and as it got deposited, these thin slivers of sand also got deposited around it to create this majestic uh, uh, layer of rock. And here are some examples, they're just six from India. Uh, different parts of India, and there's one uh, very nice stromatolite layer in uh, near Raj Mahal, uh, in uh, at the border of uh, the Raj Mahal district and, and Purulia. Uh, look at uh, these uh, rocks, beautiful rocks. All of them are actually made by live microorganisms. All of them who were cooperating with one another. It was like uh, you know creatures sharing information and resources to say that listen, I'm going to support you with this resource. In return, you need to give me this. It's a bit like housewives. But what, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, the oxygen production that made the future of evolution, of macro evolution, of multicellular organisms happened because these creatures got together, produced enough oxygen and created not just oxygen, free oxygen, but also several other things like ozone layer. The ozone layer was created because these organisms produced so much oxygen for the first time. It made possible that the fact that the ozone layer would, would cut off all the ultraviolet light that was coming from the sun that had prevented multicellular life to arise. Um, my favorite travels are by road and I like, or even trains, when I get to see cut sections like these, although you see destruction of uh, forests and lands and river and you know beautiful rock formations, the consolation that I have is I get to see a swathe of, uh, uh, of, of geological time uh, because if you were to look at the lowest rock here, the lowest layer of, layer of rock, it's about 320 million years old. And at the, at the, at the layer that is between that, uh, you know, the, the large swathe of rock that you see at the bottom and that parallel uh, thin layer is a layer where you find wonderful fish fossils. And it's relatively easy for you to go and find it yourself. You can have a tabletop of, uh, you know, a fish fossil and you know, regale your friends with uh, you know over a coffee. But you know the, the 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 thing is that we stop looking at the ground beneath our feet because it holds such amazing uh, uh, stories about our history and how creatures arose back in time. The earliest creatures on land were these fungi-like creatures, and the flower-like creature on the bottom is about the size of a dinner plate or a you know the LP records that we used to have. Something about that size. But the, 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 the fonts that you see, the palm-like uh, structures that you see at the, at the, at the rear are fun the fungi that no longer exist in this size. These would be about the size of about a short, uh, you know, a short guava tree. Can you imagine the bread mold that grows on our breads, you know, when you leave it out in the moisture, which is that thin, small thing, that black layer that you get on top could have well been the ancestors would have been this size, you know? Isn't it amazing that the fungi, the first land creatures were giant in sizes. It's like, I don't know whether many of you have read Tintin and the Shooting Star, you know, he talks about a giant uh, a mushroom. It's exactly like that, you know? It's a very, like, and, and mushrooms are fungi, right? They're fungi. So this is exactly quite, quite like that, the first creatures that grew along the edge of the water, uh, living off spores and other waste that came. 
uh, the spores would ge germinate and create this. They would be short living, but they would grow quickly. Let's come to 750 million years ago, a more believable time in our, in our understanding. The red star that you see on the top left is where India is. India is still back into the ice ages. Now, closer to the center, there's a thin line that you see. That's the equator, right? Just below the equator, you see a blue, light blue layer. And below that is a triangular piece. It looks like the head of a dog, right? That's Greenland. Greenland was actually green. It was ice ice free. There was no ice there. India, on the other hand, we imagine it to be a tropical hot country, was under ice 750 million years ago, right? And notice that uh, Kolkata is actually touching Perth. So two great cricketing uh, grounds, you know, uh, the Calcutta, great cricket pitch of Calcutta, the Eden Gardens and Perth, the Waka, are actually touching each other. So you don't even need to have a visa at the time, but the problem is there's no great evolution that has happened because humans are going to evolve exactly 750 million years later. We've possibly been the last great mammals to evolve. We still are not in the scene. In fact, the first metacellular animals, our earliest ancestors are also not on the scene. It's only the single celled animals that are ruling the world, causing these great ice ages. And among the things that happens at this time is the great meltdown, something that happens around Jodhpur. The 750 million years ago ice trap was broken because of a massive volcanic activity that happened near Jodhpur called the Malani event. And this is one of the creatures that emerged after the Malani event. This is a giant kelp-like algal creature. You see these lines that are going like a river, but this is about six and a half foot sandstone block. It's not a satellite image, Manojit. Don't, don't be amazed. But this is something so easy to find. It gets cut into making uh, stone slabs for your for for, for the floor. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> or is used for you know various other purposes. <coughs> Excuse me. And you know this is one of the earliest uh, giant creatures uh, called the kelp that emerged at this time in shallow seas. The first microbial and giant microbial creatures to emerge was also around Jodhpur, in a place in a mine called Dulmera, where this is where this comes from. And look at these beautiful creatures, you know. Look at these; they they look like screws and nails, but they are actually creatures that live in burrows in soft mud, feeding on unicellular organisms. But the first creatures to emerge with vertebrae are the ancestors of the fish. And incidentally, even the Bible says that the amphibians were, came second, the fish came first. And the fish are possibly the only creatures among the vertebrates who have not left the place of their origin. Every other creature, including the amphibian, which actually originated in the waters, has left waters rather permanently. The very, very few amphibians that now live fully in water. The reptiles originated in the seas but eventually migrated to land, right? So the fish are possibly the only adherents of the place from where they originated. And the, the ancestor of the amphibians was possibly the first to actually develop uh, feet like these. And we have wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, footprint marks from about 375 million years ago, even in India. In Leh and uh, Upper Reaches of Leh, we've got a, a cliff where have, we have wonderful uh, footprints of the earliest amphibian trying to make a crossover to land. There's one from Poland. This is actually made by a Polish artist to commemorate the, the, the landfall of the amphibians that happened 375 million years ago. But let's come to about 400 million years to 375 million years ago. India, if you notice, is on the bottom right, that red star that you see on the bottom right. And if you look at right dead in the center, it's America. Much of America, if you look at all the states of America, which are marked on these thin lines, are actually underwater, except for Newfoundland and parts of Baffin Island and, you know, north part of Canada. Much of America does not exist, right? There's no Alaska, there's no California, nothing. 400 million years ago, there's just India, Australia, Antarctica, and a few other islands, China and Brazil, and parts of Africa, right? I'm now going to move quickly. 
and come to what happened between 400 million years and about 250 million years ago. The vegetation of the time was this, something like this. Now this is very critical because we may think, not much think of it now because it looks pretty monotonous. They look like palms and tree ferns and cycads. The bottom right, you see that small palm-like creature. That's the cycad that grows, which we call the royal palm. It's uh, actually not a palm, it's a cycad which grows in gardens. I'm sure that the Bengal club has a cycad just before its reception at, the, uh, uh, at, at a park or a lawn outside. I'm quite sure because this is the thing to put outside. And it is something which is not very, uh, demands too much care and tending. But you know, what, what is remarkable about this picture is, although it's the monotony of not having too much diversity, notice that this is largely water-based. They grow in water, uh, like terrain, the shallow uh, lakes and margins of land where there's water ingress. And what happens during the period between 400 million years and 252 million years is that there is a massive flood that keeps happening every 24 or 48 hours or every 72 hours in some parts of the world. And vegetation gets carried and swept over and over again into depressions. And what it does is it creates the first coal mines of the world. So much of the coal that exists in South Africa and India and, and the rest of the world is from this period. It's called the period, it's called the Permian. And look at the layers. Now, you know, right in the center, if you were to look very closely, those are trucks. You see where there's a place, there's a plume of smoke in the, in the, in the top half of the image. And that these four small beetle-like things, those are actually trucks. Right? They're Tatar trucks trying to carry coal. And that's the depth of the Singroli mine. And Singroli mine is one of the shallowest mines in India. And perhaps the world. So think about the amount of vegetation that was deposited layer over layer to create all the energy that we consume today. Right? Now that is something that is benefiting us uh, you know, in, in these times. But this is also the time around 290 million years. This is where India is. India has come back into the age where there's an ice. And, but notice that uh, Perth has moved further away from Calcutta, right? And the eastern margin is now closer to Antarctica. So from Chennai, you could actually go to uh, uh, Port Munro, which is the landing place for, uh, of the Antarctica. If you ever go for a, you know, a visit to Antarctica, and I, I urge you, if you want to do it, please do it soon, because it's not going to stay there for the next 20 years. Uh, but you know, this is how India was packed. And on the western coast, if you notice, it's Madagascar, and we've got Africa touching uh, Gujarat. So you know, from Addis Ababa to Ahmedabad would be just a, a day and a half's walk over. So, but 251 million years ago, there was a massive volcanic activity which released methane that was deposited by the organisms that I was telling you about, that was burying all the carbon, those got released. And in a very, very uh, rapid uh, period of time, all the methane that came out killed about 95% of all life that was created thus far. So the macro creatures that were being created, the amphibians, the fish, the sharks, the crocodiles, the, the cycads, the ferns, and all those beautiful plants that I showed you in the shallow seas, all of them perished. Only a few handful of survivors from each of those survived to give us what we, ex what we have today. And these are the creatures that existed at the time. If you look at the on the left, this is a creature called Lystrosaurus. It is a creature that existed, uh, you know, it was the grazer of the, of the day. It was the cow of the Permian period. Okay. And uh, it lived in herds and it would go uh, grazing all around the shallow uh, water. And on the right, you see the ancestor of the, uh, the crocodile, the Chasmatosaurus. But on the bottom right, if you notice that creature, which is sitting, which is actually, uh, uh, you know, over another lizard-like creature, it is our ancestor, the mammal-like reptile, okay? Now notice that it looks like a rodent, but it is not a rodent. It's got poisonous teeth, it's got scaly legs, and it's got a scaly tail, okay? Our immediate ancestors were reptiles. So if you were calling your headmaster or headmistress or your teachers a snake, you were dead, dead right, because we actually emerged from reptiles. 
in fact there is one example that you have even today that you can see very commonly in people that links us to reptiles and that is scaliness you know we get eczema and psoriasis it is caused by a, a gene which is there in fish and reptiles and some amphibians but if it gets activated in humans we get scaly skin which is like psoriasis or eczema or in extreme cases there is a disease called ichthyosis right which is ichthyo means as you know is fish ichthyology is the study of fish so ichthyosis is when you get scales all over your body and you look like a fish it's a tragic uh, situation because it's extremely painful any child who gets ichthyosis is a is a is a very troubled child but what i'm trying to come here is that at the permian level when even when the extinction was before the extinction happened all these creatures existed the amphibian the reptile the ancestor of the mammals the mammal like reptiles also were there i want you to now come to the early jurassic period you know after the 252 million years when all these creatures had died the creatures that survived gave rise to the earliest ancestors of what this creature the footprint of this creature is now this i know manojit has read my book well so he knows what it is you notice this uh, on the right hand side of this one rupee coin is this triangular trident shaped uh, uh, impression and this is a footprint of a chicken sized creature which look like this it's made by a you know a friend of mine i mean i have not met him he's a virtual friend but he was kind enough to draw it for me uh, of how this creature would have looked like this rock that we found was near in 2012 near jaisalmer okay now the creature that is there is a small um, early ancestor of a dinosaur trying to look for any remains that the sea has left early in the morning and before the larger dinosaurs have emerged it comes to take its pickings and go back into the hiding and the footprints that were there that i showed you earlier have now vanished because the district administration decided to widen the road and that the slab that was possibly one of the most beautiful trackways of dinosaur this dinosaur walking early in the morning along a beach and have now gone forever so we have not preserved anything that exists in india especially on dinosaurs or creatures fantastic creatures that lived before them and after them now let's come to 210 million years ago we are free of ice the immense heating by the methane that had created this is the time of the dinosaurs the star tells you where india is we are still not too far from uh, from australia or antarctica we are still packed closely and the time of the dinosaurs brings you to this handsome gentleman this is rajasaurus narmadiensis now again uh, i had to beg borrow and steal for this image a uh, friend in Hello, Pranay. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Excuse me, Pranay. Sir, I believe uh, there is some connectivity issues from Mr. Pranay's end. Right. Yes, yes. He's just entered the waiting room. Yeah, he, he'll be he'll be on his back up now, Shravajesh. Let's hope so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. that i was showing you i'm trying to get back as quickly as i can to uh, i have uh, got my network and if you bear with me for a second i will get back online uh, going to take me 30 seconds please please permit me that uh, 
uh, I'm just yes, getting yes. online now. Yes. Of course. Sorry about this. Yeah, no Sarujes, I see you now. Yes. Uh, we are seeing just an icon for you, not your screen. Really? Yes. Uh, please bear with me. I'm just trying to figure out. Um, sure. sure. Geological Survey of India. Uh, two scientists coming who came from Chicago's Field, Field Museum uh, saw this and were very excited. They said, we hadn't discovered a, 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 a carnivore as yet in India. And this became the obsession for most paleontologists in India in the mid 90s. And when they finally constructed this, they discovered that although this was smaller than the Tyrannosaurus Rex, this was more powerful because it had a stronger jaw and stronger legs. And this is what you need in boxing, right? You don't need a very, very powerful anything else, a torso or whatever. You need very strong legs to stand and take a blow. And you need a very strong jaw to rip open any predator. So this is what that, this creature could do. And this is what a typical day would look like. Uh, I mean, this is an exaggerated day, but you know, this is how a typical day along the Narmada would have looked like. You had a large carne, uh, a herbivore, which perhaps would have been killed by the Rajasaurus. But like hyenas, there were two smaller predators who would come and try stealing his kill. And within those uh, steals, there are other smaller creatures that would come and peck out smaller portions of the flesh and run away, right? That, that's a typical scene that you see even today. You know, a lioness kills a zebra, the hyenas come and snatch away pieces and go, or, or if they are larger in number, they would drive them away. It's typical scene, and because we've got similar uh, scenes preserved, both in terms of footprint and in uh, actual dinosaurs caught in the act of eating and dying, because there was a flash flood or something like that, that actually preserved them. We know that we can reconstruct a scene of this quality. The grazers look like this, massive in size, uh, would feed on these lycopods or these uh, orocarias that we now know the, the Christmas, uh, the monkey puzzle tree, as you know, or the Christmas puzzle tree from Argentina. They flourished all across India and much of uh, the Gondwana land, as it was called, at that, uh, you know, as it was named, and they lived in herds. The herds would protect the young ones, the women, uh, the, sorry, the, the female of the herds, the matriarchs would lead the pack quite like elephants and also be at the rear of the pack. And the mature females would be on the sides of the pack so that they would protect the young in the center, very much like elephants today. Or if you were to look at giraffes who go in herds. Now, I wanted to show you this picture. This, these are gouged eggs uh, from uh, Gujarat. It's, this is the sorry tale starting from Indore, west of Indore till Bharuch. You will see several repositories of these uh, chalk areas, which are now being leased out to uh, cement companies. And what they've been doing is they've been pulverizing eggs and these nesting sites to make cement. So chances are that our walls are made by dinosaur eggs. You know, that, that's a very high probability because if you were to go to Tandur, which is another very large area in Hyderabad, around Hyderabad, which makes a lot of cement. And this area where Gujarat, Ambuja, and ACC exist, we have a lot of these round shape, egg shell shape, uh, eggs, uh, giant soccer ball shaped eggs, which have been gouged out. I wanted to leave you with this. This is a collection, a clutch of eggs, which has now been considered a Mahashivling because these dinosaur eggs were aggregated together. They thought this was the Mahashivling. They put it together, the tribals saying that this would have even greater power than the shivling that they had earlier. And this is something that is now preserved. Thank God for religion for that reason, right? I mean, you, I mean, just because it's conserved this beautiful piece of rock, I can thank religion. Uh, this is another very fascinating fossil which, which was found in 2012. Uh, there was a giant snake that was found in the act of stealing eggs. And as the young of these uh, dinosaurs were emerging. It was caught in the act of eating young dinosaurs. And the entire fossil, unfortunately, 
after the papers and everything was written and the model was made, the model now exists for people to see in Chicago's Field Museum, but the fossil itself is now relegated to the basement to the Geological Survey of India in Nagpur. So we never get to see this fossil, but and the model is in Fields Museum in, in Chicago. Let's come to 88 million years. I, what I, the picture that I showed you earlier was from 210 million years. Now this is 88 million years ago. India has freed itself from Australia. Australia has migrated eastwards. Notice that Antarctica is a series of small islands. Madagascar has just separated from uh, Gujarat and Kerala. Uh, Africa had moved earlier about 170 million years ago, right? And this is the time when India is on its own trajectory, it's finally liberated itself from all the land masses that had constrained itself, and it is now free to move northwards. And this is the time when the sea, uh, which is the Indian Ocean, begins to form. Let's move about uh, 30 million years later. India has moved further north. Look at uh, no other landmass has moved that much. You would re recall that if you would look at this map, India was where Newfoundland or where New York is just now. So India has actually done a ballroom dance. It's moved all around the globe, moving from where New York is today, coming down south where South Africa is, coming then further down south to where Australia is just now, in the sense 55 million years ago or where Antarctica is right away. And then it went westwards and then northwards. So India has done a full Bhangra dance or a ballroom dance in terms of land masses. No other land mass has been so iterant. So I guess, you know, Indians being, you know, you can find an Indian, a Malayali and a Gujarati uh, in Terra del Fugo. You can find them in Napier. You can find them in Ryoko Island and in uh, Juneau, Alaska. And that's, I think, because the land itself, in some sense, made us. Uh, you know, a kind of a gumakkar, you know, uh, a vagabond. And I think that's because our landmass was moving. Perhaps <laughs> there's something that we got rubbed off from our land. But I wanted to tell you, this time is the fascinating time, in terms of the evolution of flowering plants. Before this, there were very few flowering plants. The magnolias were per perhaps the first giant, uh, you know, flowering plants. And they came with the bounty of nectar, of pollen, of fragrance, and all of them were attractive to beetles and geckos. And the earliest mammals that were now scurrying in the feet of the dinosaurs had something to look forward to at night as well, to start feeding on the insects and the geckos that were going to feed on each other uh, at night. And creatures like this, Tamandua from, uh, South, from uh, South Madagascar, look at this beautiful, uh, uh, you know, Adansonia flower. And you can see that the pollen attraction and the fragrance of, is appealing to this night, uh, night hunter. And it's waiting for an insect and till that moment will feed on the pollen and the nectar that the flower has to offer. But let's come to 38 million years. India has finally collided and it started to push northwards and Bengal and the Bengal Delta is now getting created. The Indus is getting created. And this is a time when India's margins are forming, the northern margin. The southern margins had formed after Madagascar had moved away 88 million years ago, and, Colum uh, and Sri Lanka had moved southwards. Now, this is the time when, uh, you, you know, one thing that we must remember is that the giant sea that existed between India, uh, let me go back to the slide before this. You know, the giant sea that exists from Shanghai to Spain is called the Tethys Sea. Now, this is a very important space because this is where all the evolution of elephants and monkeys and giraffes and deer and the carnivores, the cats, the dogs, everything was happening along this ridge, this, this massive seaway, the thin seaway that existed between Spain and Shanghai. And the other imp important creature that emerged at this time were the creatures that began to now instead of staying up in the trees, started to come down because they were getting heavier. And what were once cousins were now feasting on each other. So they might be related, but one developed a taste for blood, the other still eating fallen fruits or grass or nuts. So creatures, they may look similar, but one's got canines that will feed on their cousins. And this is where the diversification happens because the bounty of nature 
offering new fruits and new flowers and new grasses and new varieties of uh, things to eat, including flesh. And this is a typical scene of what the coast of Gujarat would have looked at because we've got very good amber record from lignite mine. Lignite is a poor cousin of coal. It is wood that has not fully de decomposed under pressure and therefore is not black in color, it's grayish brownish. And within it is the sap that forms into a hard stone-like thing which is called amber. And within amber you have remains of hair, teeth, and sometimes intact organisms, including lizards, uh, centipedes, wasps, ants, spiders. And we find an amazing array of amber in uh, along the west coast of India. And this is how they've been able to reconstruct the entire forest because they found traces of pollen and hair and feather and everything else. And therefore you are able to imagine the entire landscape. We are waiting to find large uh, collection of bones. We started finding some very nice bones, but you know it's still early days, and there's so much to uh, see through. But let's come back to this time when you know uh, 38 million years ago, again India has collided, and you know the collision has uh, made sure that the Tethys Sea that separated uh, the Indian landmass from Shanghai to Spain is now closed. But this is the grand time of the evolution of the whales. Whales emerged in the Shimla Hills, in Assam Hills and in the Kutch region of India. You find a treasure, treasure trove of fossils from that region. I'm not going to go into this, but you know, this is a drawing that I have made. I could not find a large drawing of, uh, you know, all the whales together, a portrait of whales. But if you were to look at extreme left-hand corner, that small mouse deer-like creature is, was entirely terrestrial. And it was the creature that actually decided to start eating and uh, ferreting for food around ponds and lakes and developed a taste for not just the reeds and the weeds that grew in shallow lakes and ponds, but also for some succulent snails and crabs and other creatures. And its ancestors then increasingly started to spend more time in shallow water. And notice the creature on the right to that uh, extreme left creature has webbed feet and it's got a fluke-like tail. And slowly the legs melt, they become into flippers and has a more spindle-like body and then you start seeing the evolution of the modern whale, right? But this Cinderella story from being a small mouse deer-like creature, you know, the size of a small uh, cocker spaniel becoming into a giant creature, perhaps the largest creature ever to live in the sea is the blue whale. Think about it, in 38 million years, this is what this creature began, right? And I, I want to end my presentation now by saying that, you know, the closure of the Tethys is marks the boundary of India. And it is ironical that I'm saying this now, because if you were to define India in geological terms, the outer boundary of the Brahmaputra and the Indus, because they both originate about a few kilometers of each other from Mount Kailash, right? You go east, it is the Brahmaputra that originates there, the Sanko. And if you go west, it is the Indus, right? And both of them actually make that course that actually is the closure of the Tethys Sea. Now this beautiful image actually shows you that as India was, on the left is India, the right is the Eurasian or the Chinese or the Tibetan plateau. Now as India was closing in, the sediments of the sea were getting sandwiched in between, right? And look at the beautiful uh, layers of sediments that have got preserved in this hill. And in, in this hill, you find, again, wonderful fossils. It's just a paradise for people like me. I can just go berserk because I might find a fossil of a creature that has never been discovered, right? So this is all I have to say. Uh, I just want to say a quick final word about why I look at deep natural history. Uh, I, I believe that it builds humility and it builds a perspective because if you do not appreciate the rock beneath your feet or the sand in the river or the pond in your backyard, we will not understand how climate change works and why these things are important for us. I think scientists need to talk to each other, especially geologists, hydrologists, climate change people, foresters, epidemiologists, uh, and you know, just about everybody, economists, uh, because 
what we've just learned is that damaging ecology, damaging the climate is going to be a price that we pay for, uh, for the economy. And we are seeing this now with COVID. We are going to see that with climate change. All of them are interlinked. And I think this is something which is going to be very, very important for us because we don't appreciate the plankton that gives us all the oxygen. We are gung-ho about planting trees. I, I really admire trees. I love trees. I've got nothing against them. But believe me, it's the humble plankton that's going to save us at the end of the day. And my final slide is, what should we be doing? My final thoughts are these, that I think we, we don't uh, foster any curiosity in our children. Uh, I, our children study by rote. They are not supposed to ask questions or, or be critical about scientific theories and hypotheses. I think we need to break the mold. We need to break the mold of not only colleges and schools, but also how museums are decide, designed. I, I think we also need to break the mold on how we need to be speaking about climate change. Because if you were to look at any of the large discussions that are happening on climate change, no one, I, and trust me when I say no one, including the IPCC, has a full picture of what's happening on climate change. And my final submission is, we've, we've got so many million, millions of stories. Every village in India has a geological and a natural history story of its own. Why can't we have a story or a museum based on Bengal or the Darjeeling Hills? How did the Darjeeling Hills come to exist? How did uh, the Purulia Forest come to exist, right? How did the Meghna meet the Brahmaputra and the Jamuna meet the Ganga? That's a fascinating story, you know? There's, not, there's no single map developed by the government of India on the submarine canyons that exist under the Bay of Bengal. It's all created by the mighty Ganga, and we've done nothing about it. 22% of all the carbon that is buried by geological systems is done by the Ganga alone. The Ganga is a very unique river. Its water doesn't get spoiled, not because of mythological reasons, but for geochemical reasons that only one river in the world has. And for that, if you want to find the answer, you have to buy my book. Thank you so much. This is my book. Uh, it's available free online in pirated websites. I urge you to at least read it. If you don't, don't want to buy it, please don't buy it. But I urge you to control F, find the thing that you want to find about Hyderabad, about Havra, about Midnapur, about Barishal, about Tripura, whichever part of the world that you want to find about. I have a huge index in, at the end. And of course, I'm available at your beck and call. If you are going to travel, please send me an email. I would be happy to help you, uh, at least help you look at things that you, you might otherwise have missed. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you, Pradhan, for this uh, very fascinating talk. There are uh, great compliments uh, for you in the chat box already from a lot of people, who, which I'm sure you can see. Uh, but this is time for questions and answers, maybe uh, four or five. So ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat box. You'll find the icon uh, at the bottom of your screen, dead center. Uh, Pranay, uh, question from Rajiv Sethi. We treat fossils, for example, dinosaur eggs so ca callously as mentioned by you, only in India or other countries also? Uh, is it because there are available in plenty? For example, Shole village wasn't saved. I guess the question is, are these things saved uh, yeah. Not saved only in India, or does this happen uh, elsewhere as well? well? I think the callousness is there in several uh, low and middle income countries. But I think, uh, you know, if we are trying to catch up with Korea and China and any other country, I think we've done a very bad job when it comes to, uh, to our geo heritage sites. Uh, I think uh, leases, for example, they could be carve outs from even existing uh, mine leases because. Not I when I, I I might have exaggerated Rajiv that you know all the eggs have gone. I mean I would say five percent of the eggs remain. But uh, uh, you know my my sense is that you know despite uh, several of these large companies knowing that you know this is a geo heritage site and they would not be able to do it elsewhere in the world, 
it is tragic that it's not just the government, but also the private sector, which controls a lot of land, especially the mining space, which they could do. Uh, I think there's a lot that we need to do. The word fossil, for example, does not appear in Indian legislation. Uh, the word geology does not appear in Indian legislation. Geological Survey of India comes under Ministry of Mines. Uh, their, their job is to excavate and, and extract as much resource as they can. And in this day and age, of course, it has taken a real backseat. Uh, everything is for loot. Uh, Everybody is ready for the loot. Uh, everything that is sacrosanct for you and me is not sacrosanct for the capitalist world. Uh, sorry, that's, sorry. That's, that's, sorry, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Rodin Chatterjee, I think, uh, wants to know a, a little more about the Ganges. Uh, Ganga, you said, I remember that it is a unique river, not because of mythological reasons, but for geochemical reasons. So Rathin, Rathin, I was hoping you'd buy my book, but I guess you're not going to buy my book. So that's fine. <laughs> you know, I was, I was, I'm hoping, you know, that, you know, Ganga is, uh, you know, taken out from the mythology, uh, uh, you know, uh, narrative. And there is serious consideration given to it, especially when it comes to damming and hunting and many other things. Uh, the reason why Ganga water does not get spoiled is in the, uh, the, the way the glacial water and the monsoon water rubs against the granite. As you know, the Himalayas are a very young mountain. The other mountain ranges like the Alps are limestone mountains. Uh, the Andes, which are also young, but they are, uh, they are andesite mountains, which are basalt. They are volcanic. They, uh, they're not because of collision. Now, granite, when it uh, when you know the rain that falls is not pure water it's carbonic acid it's light carbonic acid so when silica and carbonic acid react they produce something which is called the urease reaction and for this again you'll have to go back to my book but what urease reaction is basically it traps it makes free silica available for carbonic acid to bind so basically carbon dioxide binds with silica and stays bound till it reaches the submarine canyons of the Indian Ocean. And that's where it gets deposited. So the, the trick in the question is here, that when I wrote my book, I found the answer to why does the Bay of Bengal, the Andaman Sea, and the Java and Sumatran range have such diversity in mollusks? You know, mollusks are these sea snails and she shelled animals. And when, then you realize that there is a very high burial of silica, which is available, free silica, which shells, shelly creatures need. And that's one of the answers. Now we have been able to trace the silica because you can now uh, radio date using elemental analysis that silica that has come out from say Kedarnath belt or say Kudremukh, uh, sorry, Kedarnath or, uh, or Gomukh belt can actually be seen in the Javan mollusk because now there is clear link between the, the silica that left couple of hundred thousand years ago, eventually traveled to the Sumatran Sea, which was taken up by an oyster or any other shelly creature to make its shell, and it found it there. So it is as simple as that. The connections were not found, right? Now that silica is the one that actually deters organisms to grow. The Yamuna water is stinky, right? And if you go to even to uh, Kanpur or to Allahabad, the Ganga is still very clean. You know, it is not full of sewage because this cleansing process and preventing the bacteria to survive is is immense in 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 uh, in uh, in the Ganga. So Yuri's reaction, uh, uh, you know, there was this amazing Yuri's reaction is something that uh, uh, you know was studied by Harold Yuri. He's a he was a great chemist. Never came to India, but he just imagined the Yuri's reaction taking place, saying that carbon gets absorbed in water and stays in water for a long time. Now that's the reason Ganga makes uh, the, the, uh, the, the carbon to stay fixed and stay deposited in deep submarine canyons for that minor reaction that is taking place on the face of the uh, Himalayan hills. That's the long and short of it, Rathin. Right. Um... The last two questions are along similar lines. Okay. From, from Prabir Dasgupta, who is saying, who's asking, please tell us how we can consciously develop an interest in India's natural history. And also from Bashav Rai Chaudhary, 
in order to spread this kind of awareness further, how can we encourage people to have more of a scientific temper? Uh, you know, uh, I don't think there are any easy answers. And I, I find it very disturbing when history and geography are taught separately or biology and chemistry and physics are taught separately. I think, first of all, there's all integration. And I think um, asking a teacher a history question in geography is a legitimate question. The reasons why, for example, Mughals did not create uh, you know, anything uh, east of Jabalpur is because malaria was there. Now, this is something that should have been taught to us uh, in a biology class as well. You know, The dispersion of humans, even very recently, is determined by the genes and the microbes and the geology. Right? So, yeah, I don't think I'm answering your question, but what I'm trying to say is that let's make natural history fascinating. And the answers are in the sun, in the volcanoes, in the geotectonism, in the oceans, in the viruses. And all that needs to come together to tell you a comprehensive narrative about why things exist the way they do. I don't think we, we've taken things for granted that Western Ghats exist because something happened and we don't care. Well, they, you better care because if you're going to interlink rivers, it's going to do what's happening in Kerala, right? So, so I'm not trying to, uh, you know, cast aspersions on one government or a set of people or a state. What I'm trying to say is we've got ourselves into a real mess, whether it's Bombay facing water shortages, considering Bombay has seven lakes, it still has water shortages. Kerala has rivers, it's got 42 rivers, and yet it has no river sand. It gets river sands from Vietnam and Cambodia, right? It has no sand to construct homes, right? Think about it, what a tragedy, right? I think we have got, into us, got ourselves into a space where we do not link the larger natural history issues to what we have studied in schools and what is relevant to our survival, right? So I think this is a larger discourse. I don't think I have all the answers. I'm only a curious cat who's looking for answers and ferreting for information. And uh, I may be uh, wrong several times, but I think I'd rather be wrong, get the wrong. I, it's better that I give you the wrong answer, but still probe the right question, because I think the yeah. question is more interesting than finding the right answer because the answer will get tempered and corrected all the time as new evidence comes. On which note, Paramita Mukherjee Monlik has a suggestion. This is not a question that you should give presentations in schools to make children aware about natural history of India. But thank you very much, uh, Pranay. Uh, uh, may I ask Monajit Dashgupta, my colleague on the library committee to deliver the official vote of thanks. He's the person who's responsible uh, for, for organizing this talk, and he knows your book very well. Over to you, Monoji. Thank you very much, uh, Shaurajesh. Well, on behalf of the library committee and members of the Bengal Club, a very, very warm thanks to Pranay Lal for this wonderful talk. Uh, passing through uncertain times, as we all are, this evening was a journey to savor, Pranay. In Pranay's words, it was a celebration of all those who set off for answers in the terra incognita of science. This is a story of some four billion years and counting. And the remarkable features of the Indian subcontinent that were unfurled evoke awe and wonder. Pranay wears his scholarship lightly, but Indica, his work, is clearly a labor of love and a culmination of many years of travel and research. It would have whetted many an appetite and surely tempts us to dust our backpacks and set off on our personal journeys of discovery. Thank you, Pranay, once again for taking time off from your demanding schedule and giving us an evening to remember. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here. And thank you, Pranay, very much. Goodbye and good night. Good night.